So here we go with a piece about building a bridge with Jean Rodolphe Perronnet, who was, it has to be said, a great engineer. If you don't know him, you might wonder who he is. He was born in 1708, lived till 1794, which means that he lived through the terror. And that in turn means that the revolutionaries recognised that they needed him as an engineer, regardless of where he'd been before. He was apprenticed to an architect at 17. In 1736, so aged 28, he entered the Corps de Pont et Chaussée. By 1747, he was the director of the King's Bureau of Engineers. And 1763 saw him as the chief engineer of the king. He became director of the École des Ponts et Chaussées in 1775. So where is he there? We're talking about a man of 67 and clearly a dedicated teacher. In 1788, he was made a foreign member of the Royal Society. He was a teacher. And he left us this wonderful book about the construction of bridges in the 18th century. Descriptions of various bridges, um, but I'm going to concentrate on one. And that will shortly be my last serious attempt at French pronunciation, the new bridge at Neuilly. And here it is almost finished. I can't show you a proper photograph because it's been demolished and replaced by a modern bridge. The work began in 1768 and here we see where things had reached in July. First in elevation, well sectional elevation, and I'll perhaps come back to that in a second. What can we see here? Well there's two coffer dams, one around the abutment on the left, one in the river, which is not really quite complete, although there is a bucket wheel in there pumping out water, being driven by a water wheel between the two coffer dams. You can see a training wall leading water into the water wheel to help to drive it. There's another bucket wheel in the left-hand coffer dam, and in the left-hand dam there's lots of piling and things like that going on, and again we'll come back to that shortly. Here, just a little later, we see the foundations for that pier going in. And again, we'll look in more detail at that, but you can see the coffer dam is now finished. Cheap piles in two rings filled in between with clay to make it waterproof. And now there's another dam being built against what is an island on the right hand side. And here is a section through the end 68 with that pier growing up to above water level now. Uh, the pump is still running. He provided us with detailed drawings of this, but I think he also realised that they weren't entirely clear without the help of this pictorial view. You can see that both the water wheel and the bucket wheel are in timber frames, so they can be lifted up and down to follow the level of the water. And between them is a shaft, which is actually hanging from a slightly larger wheel in the middle at a bearing. We'll see that in more detail in a plan view in a moment. And then the bucket wheel tips its water out at the side into a trough and back into the river. So the water is being pumped by the river back into the river. And here are the detailed drawings. You can see the shaft between the two wheels. Obviously, it can't be that long in one piece, so it has to be spliced. It has to be supported. And the bearing also has to be adjustable so that they can maintain engagement at both ends. So there's a timber frame with a large wheel supporting a rope round the shaft to hold the shaft up. At the left hand side we see the bucket wheel with a slightly greater detail shown as well. And at the bottom right a cutout plan of how the buckets are to be cut from a sheet of presumably metal and folded into shape to make them more or less waterproof. So by August 1769 things are moving on. We've got a coffer dam now against the island and work going on there. That's a little bit blurry because some of these photographs have had to blown up quite considerably. But if we look at the plan, the pier in the river is now gone. The cheap piles and coffer dam are being removed. The wheel is now just driving the one bucket wheel in the island, 
and there are channels through into the core of the island so they're obviously dewatering up here on the right as well and here we move on a bit further we now have three piers built and the water being allowed to seep back in notice the main driving water wheel has been dismantled between the two coffer dams there and here's a section through at that point the water wheel is now being driven from the other side and here we have the abutment at the far side notice that there's water flowing behind it and we'll no doubt have to think about that later as well there'll be lots more detail as we go a bit further this shows some detail of how the pier is built piles go in first there are timbers across the piles the gaps are filled with stone and then the whole thing is decked out in timber and the stone pier built on timber that may seem strange but provided the timber stays under water it will be fine and it's a very long established process and again here we have an elevation of that notice that the pier on the left the arches are corbelling out a certain distance and then they're sketched in to indicate where they're going to go eventually there are two little turret cranes perched on the coffer dam in the middle of the picture and the gentleman provided us with detailed drawings of those as well and here we are in a plan view of that with the piers completed up to the springings of the arches and things being progressively demolished i thought it was probably worth putting in a whole double page spread to show how these pictures are presented they're basically the equivalent of modern progress photographs though obviously they can't be done quite so frequently and in fact the frequency goes down quite rapidly once we get into the later stages of construction so here we have a detail from one of those plans and this is there from my point of view because it shows quite clearly how the interior construction is a very much less squared decorated finish than the shell the springing of the arch obviously is in good quality flat stone the face is carefully dressed and fitted but once you get inside it's just rubble set in masonry notice how there are voids in the abutment extending the width without extending the weight and here we go starting to build arches we've got some centers in place in three of the five spans and everything else is ready to go by the end of 1771 all five centers are in place and the arches are growing and here we have a plan showing a slightly later stage of construction with stonework up from the springings at each end and big piles of stone on the center of the centering we'll see why that is in just a moment and look at some of the equipment that was also very carefully drawn and detailed because remember what he's doing here is teaching engineers how to do the job these are two of the piling rigs they're designed for different parts of the process you'll notice if we look at the left hand one first there's a little tail of rope hanging loose at the top that is used for lifting the piles into place it goes over a pulley and comes down to a windlass at the base but the main rope is split into many parts and there's a man on the end of each of those parts and the way they work it there'll be a drummer somewhere beating a drum and they will lift the hammer and drop it and lift it and drop it it doesn't need to be lifted very far because the pile doesn't have to be driven very far at a time and each time they lift they can let go grab the rope a little further down and the pile will be started very quickly once that process gets tougher and the pile stops moving we start to look for a bigger drop and then we move to the right hand piling rig which is rather slower to work there's a big wheel with a rope wound round it and a horse on the end pulling it out attached to the wheel is a rather smaller shaft so we've got big leverage and the rope goes up over the top and lifts the big weight which lifts so far and then the latch is pulled and it drops free over a considerable distance to drive the pile in of course once that's done the horse has to be backed up the rope has to be rewound there has to be enough weight on the end of the rope to carry it over that pulley and back down the other side and everything has to be attached again so the process is relatively slow but much firmer than manpower driving top left there is a grid showing how the piles are laid out figure eight in the middle there is a plan view just overlaid slotted in between figures six and seven the two elevations here's something that really surprised me i'm pretty sure this is a horse driven concrete mixer 14 feet wide 
and then a big frame and the horse goes in between the two gown stands at the right hand side and the whole thing is just rotated to stir the mix and here we have a mortar mill it's a wooden wheel full of stone to give it weight rotated by the power of a horse in the left hand thing there the giveaway that it's mortar is that barrel b on the left hand side and lime was delivered in barrels in those days and the barrel would have been chipped in and the mortar would have been mixed and you might ask how i know it's a mortar mill well there's a modern one some things just don't seem to change do they so let's look a bit closer at the piling process. We've got a piling rig, a couple of piling rigs at the left hand side there. I'm not sure what those little Y shaped frames are, uh, though they're possibly something to do with cutting the piles off. I assume that the bigger piles are ones that have been driven but not yet cut off, and the smaller heads either are pre hammering or after they've been cut. And here we see the construction of the pier in slightly more but slightly furry detail the piles are in place timbers going across to form a grillage boarding over the top of that and the stone on top of that and this shows the pier building up stepwise the shadows are casting to the right so we assume the left hand side is highest once again we see quite clearly how the rubble core is actually very open there are lots of spaces in there they're no doubt at least partly filled with mortar, but I suspect only partly filled with mortar. And this is the way masonry has been constructed since time immemorial. Let's look at a few of these machines. I don't think this is a revolving crane. It swings, but I don't think you'd be able to take it right round. Ladder wheels on the back to drive it, so the men there climb up the outside rather than going the in, around the inside of a sort of hamster wheel affair. A pulley system on the end to double the power and clearly capable of lifting quite big stones and swinging them backwards and forwards into place. Then there's a straightforward hoist again with a ladder wheel um, or a pair of ladder wheels just designed to lift stone from the carriage down below up into the higher level for use on the bridge. That can be seen, that frame can be seen in a lot of the general drawings. This is an elevation and a few details of the center and i find this quite a wonderful thing if you look at the piece labeled c right hand center figure four you can see that it has a notch right through and then a wedge then a notch then a wedge and three bolt holes piece label d shows how it fits together piece label b is in place and it has the wedges in a different place so you have wedges at the bottom and slots at the top at one point and then wedges at the top and slots at the bottom at the next so the timbers go two of the timbers go straight through each of the radials two of them stop and sit against wedges and the whole thing then forms an arch and the advantage of the way the wedges go together is that it provides a little bit of cross grain wood which forms a cushion and distributes the load so if it doesn't fit perfectly it squeezes and the load is distributed between the four timbers and then the ones that go straight through stop the whole thing from buckling as the load goes on then transversely there are pairs of beams as at figure five clamping this lot together so they go between long beams round these two-piece wedge pieces and the wide slots hold those wedges together and the long beam holds all the centers in their relationship to each other and then below each of those there's just a little notched beam that drops over the bottom member and, and provides another layer of bracing if you look carefully you can see that there are also timbers running at angles from those cross beams up to the main cross ties let's move on here's a detail at the end where the edge of the arch is tapered inwards and this is a little bit of an addition on the center to make that taper and here we see the thing being assembled. We're using guy derricks, just masts with four ropes to control where the top is, windlasses and pulleys. And notice there's a levelling system there that any modern engineer would recognise with a sighting device on a tripod and a levelling staff shown in various positions on the left hand side. On the right at G, there's a little packing piece off the temporary bridge holding up that radial timber 
as the construction develops. And as you can see, a radial piece can fit on the end of two projecting timbers. The two through timbers can then be lifted into place in those and the lid put on from the other side and a couple of long bolts through to hold everything together. Doesn't require much force, which is really rather nice. And here it is almost finished, the last timbers going in. There's just one more to go and it's being lifted at the moment. And once again, we get a nice picture of the job in progress. And we see what look like tiny men and massive timbers. And that might be slightly hard to believe. But if you look at the scale of these drawings, those timbers really are half a meter square. They are massive. These are the diagonals that brace the centre against flopping over sideways. I don't doubt that there are more details somewhere, but you can see that there are some fancy angle cuts, and this is how they fit together. So there's eight centres, and then the diagonals go in, pushing one way at one side, the other way at the other side, and they fit between horizontal members in the bottom of the frame and horizontal members at the top of the frame. So they also provide bracing in this elevation, and here you can see the bolts through the various bits holding them together. Here's how the whole thing sits on the pier, and it's a little bit tricky because there isn't much room to lower it, and notice there's actually nothing there to suggest that the centre would be lowered, and that's an interesting feature because here, as we see, as the thing starts to go together, at the two ends there are timbers and wedges below the stones on top of the centre. Much sharper drawing, and you can see the timbers and wedges perched on the centering, holding up one under each stone, uh, which gives us an indication of how this centre is going to be taken out by releasing those wedges one at a time, which allows the engineer to control the process very carefully. Interestingly, there's a capstan there which is used for lifting, and the top of it seems to be anchored to the centre. So the centre gets pressed into multiple purposes. And here again we see the stone going into place and that pile of stone on the top. Why is there a pile of stone on the top? Well, if we just go back a bit and look at it, as the weight builds up on the ends of this timber arch, which is actually relatively flexible, it would burst upwards. And that process is carefully controlled by piling stone at the crown. The stone is going to be used at the crown eventually, but it needs to be there fairly early in the process, so it's just stacked on the centre to start with. And here's the job finished with all the arch stones in place, and this picture shows lots of surveying tools. At S, at the top left, we've got that sighting device again, and there are staffs at various positions around the ring. There's a protractor device with a plumb line on it, which allows the angles to be checked and various other things. So at this point, as the wedges are taken out of, from under the center, under the stone, the trueness of the arch is tested all the way along. And then we get to some real fun. So here's a plan of what really is a circus. There's a huge area set aside on the left-hand side of the bridge for the general public. The interesting side where all the capstans are is reserved for the king and all the uh, nobles who have tents to stand in. There's a special tent for the king, there's a long one for the nobles, and they can all join there and watch as the centres are pulled out of place. And you can see in the top picture, the centres falling over into the water. Here we have, once again, a picture of the whole thing. Half of Paris has turned out to see it. There is the timber from the centering floating away down the river and being gathered up by boats as fast as they can go. Um, a spectacular piece of theatre, and wouldn't it be great if engineers did more of that these days? We noted that the bridge went to an island and there was a river behind the island. It's time to fill that in. And what better way than to build a little jetty, pull up some boats alongside it and fill the boats full of rocks, and how better to fill the boats full of rocks than to invite the public to come and join in. And here they are all throwing rocks into the boats. And once the boats have sunk, here they are. We can uh, fill in the island and reclaim the land.
And then, of course, the whole thing has to be finished off. And here we have lots of pictures of travelling scaffolds. I'm not sure the health and safety executive would be very happy with them, but um, it was a fairly normal way of working in those days, hanging scaffolds over the side and the men cleaning and pointing the stonework. There's a guy down there underneath. Um, there's one on a frame floating on a fairly wide boat right up at the crown, pointing things up. And the reason that has to be done is that mortar falls out of the joints as they place the stones and the pointing has to be replaced. This is just another view of the same thing, showing how big the scaffold is on those boats right through the full width of the bridge. And then there are various trestles and hanging scaffolds on the sides as well on the wing walls. And this isn't a picture of the bridge. This is the Pont de la Concorde, uh, which was the last of Perronet's works. It has been widened on both sides, so you can't actually see his bridge in the middle of here. Um, it was only finished in 1791. A lot of the stone that was used was from the rubble of the Bastille. And I remain fascinated that someone who was obviously held in some respect by the king and worked for the king for his whole life should have survived the terror and been allowed to complete this bridge. So there we are, building a bridge in the 18th century.